Today's stuff we're going to be learning is Yevamot Nun Zayin. Um, a few short announcements. Class this week will be as usual. Yom Zikaron, Yom Atzimaut. It's all normal, um, regular time. Uh, and the classes will go up as usual. Um, the bookmarks. We extended the, de- the deadline. So if you haven't ordered bookmarks, you have till Friday to order bookmarks. And then we will, it'll take some time. Whoever ordered, it'll take a little while till we print and then send them, etc. So patience, but within, hopefully you'll get them within a few weeks, uh, maybe closer to a month, depending on the mail system is not the most reliable. Okay, um, today's stuff is sponsored by the Cohen, Ray, and Maybaum families in loving memory of their mother, Elizabeth Maybaum, Elisheva Bat Yehuda, on her third year at sight. You inspired us, you supported us, you make us laugh. We miss your wise counsel and insights. Um, we miss you. And today's stuff is also sponsored by Avi, Avi Yonitzman in loving memory of Albert Kovni Ben Edel and health to Serena Kovni Bat Rachel. Okay, we're going to get started. I'll review from the Mishnah. Um, on the bottom of Nun Vav Amud Bet. Um, as I said, there's a study guide for today, so you can use it to help you. Um, I'm only going over the beginning part of the Mishnah because that's what's going to be relevant for our conversation today. Any kind of forbidden relationship, I'm not going to go into all the details, but any kind of woman who is not allowed to marry a Kohen. There's a bit of an issue here with the Mishnah because it mentions a Chalutza, which we already learned is only rabbinic. And the Gemara is going to talk about is if these are all Do'oraita, Torah. I'm not going to get into that, but there's a bit of a question about the Chalutza in our Mishnah. There's a whole bunch of things I'm not going to really get into, but I'll mention a little bit, which is the, okay, we'll get there soon and I'll tell you where there's some confusion here. But the case in the Mishnah, even the case in the Mishnah is a little bit confusing. We explained it yesterday based on one interpretation, but there's other interpretations as well. We explained that we're talking here about a daughter of a Kohen who gets betrothed to one of these forbidden relatives. You know, one of these, not relatives, one of these forbidden relationships, like she's a divorcee and she gets betrothed to a Kohen, um, to a Kohen. So, mina erusin lo yochlu betruma, Rabbi Lazar, Rabbi Shima Machshirin. So, there's a machloket between Tanakama, which we said in the Gemara already we understood as Rabbi Meir, and Rabbi Lazar and Rabbi Shima, whether Kiddushin itself is enough to make her not allowed to eat truma anymore. Now, if we say it's, we're talking about a Bat Kohen, then we're talking about that she used to eat truma and now she's disqualified. Remember, anyone who does some sort of forbidden relationship is forbidden from eating truma, right? She's disqualified from kahuna, right? She's disqualified from truma. She also can't marry the Kohen, but she's also disqualified from eating truma. Now, the, some people think that we're actually talking about a Kohen and a Bat Yisrael. And then you have to understand the Mishnah a little bit differently. But we're going to stick with that it. it's a Bat Kohen. And the issue is, is she allowed to go back to her father's house and eat truma or not? Just from the Erusin, the engagement alone, the betrothal. Okay, remember, Erusin, Kiddushin, betrothal, engagement, it's all the same term. So we use them interchangeably. So the question is, now the Gemara is going to term this, okay, which is very often, the mission gives cases, doesn't usually use terminology. Later on, there becomes this terminology that kind of sticks, which is they call this Mishnameret Libi Apsula Oraita. She's waiting for, right, she, the, her next step basically is to have a relationship, right, a, a physical relationship with someone who's forbidden to her. So that's the issue here. She hasn't yet, right? When does she really become Sula? When she engages in intercourse with him. But she hasn't yet done that. She's just done the Kiddushin, right? We are assuming she didn't do the Kiddushin through Bia, okay? We're assuming she did it through Shtar, through Kesef, something like that. Now, the Machloket is, is that enough to disqualify her or not? Okay, that's the Machloket. So we said, right, Rabbi Meir brought a cup of Homer and said, well, if a regular Kiddushin can forbid her from eating truma, like she gets betrothed to a, a Yisrael, then even this, there's different interpretations of what exactly Kiddush HaRashud are, but let's just assume a regular Yisrael, then of course a forbidden relationship with this Kohen is going to forbid her entirely. To which they say to him, what are you talking about? You can't compare apples and oranges. A Yisrael can forbid her because a Yisrael is not in the realm of truma at all. A Kohen has the ability to marry somebody else, and bring them into the world of eating truma. So you can't compare Kiddushay uh, Rishut of Yisrael and how much he messes up his wife with truma to a Kohen who 
theoretically in other cases could bring his wife to eat truma, even though in this case he can't, but maybe that puts him in a different place and maybe that would allow him to also not forbid her at this point without having done the bi'a, the intercourse, it sh- maybe won't forbid him from, you know, cause him to stop her at this point of the betrothal from eating truma, to disqualify her. So then we gave this case of a p'tzua daka kohen shekidesh bat Yisrael. We have this interesting case where we have a p'tzua daka, a person who is considered not permitted to marry within kahal, Yisra- kahal Hashem, like a mom's heir. Okay, they're one of these p'sule chatanut, as we call them. He did kiddush into a bat Yisrael. Now he's a kohen. Okay, even here there's different gears. So Rabbeinu Hanal says it's to a bat kohen, not a bat Yisrael. Okay, so there's d- debate about whether we're talking about he betrothed. Okay, so again, how similar this case is. Is he's a kohen, except that he's a ptua that was not really supposed to marry. He marries a woman. Now we don't know, is it a bat Yisrael or is it a bat kohen? And what's the truma issue? Is it to bring her into eating truma? Is it to stop her from... It's a little bit confusing here, right? Is she, he's disqualifying her from what she used to eat because she's a bat kohen? Or it, it almost, I mean, it matters a little bit, but commentaries read this in all different ways, like I said. Could be it's about Cohen, it could be it's about Israel. The point is, he does Kiddushin with a woman who's forbidden for him to do Kiddushin with because he's not allowed to marry a regular Israel or a Bat Cohen or any of that. So, Banu Lemachloket Rabbi Lazar ve Rabbi Shimon. So, according to Rabbi Lazar in the name of Rabbi Oshaya, this is the same Machloket as our Mishnah. Because again, what is it? It's as we call it, the Gemara, Gemara is going to say, right? Le Rabbi Meir de Amal, Mishta, now they put words in his mouth. He didn't say these words, but this is basically what he said. Mishta Mer le Biapsula de Oraita lo Achla. Once she's about to, she's already committed the first stage to a relationship that's forbidden, she's already disqualified from eating Truma. Le Rabbi Lazar, Rabbi Shimon, de Amri Mishta Mer le Biapsula de Oraita, Achla, Hanami Achla. They said she can eat. Therefore, in this case, she can eat as well, okay? Just like, we're basically saying, Kohen to Grusha is equivalent to Ptsua Daka to Abba Yisrael or Abba Kohen. It almost doesn't really make a difference. Then the Gemara says, Mimai. First of all, I want to give you an interesting case, okay? Sometimes I know you think, that part of the discussion, I think, is really theoretical. And part of these cases could be, there could be very interesting practical ramifications, okay? Like, what's the status of, uh, p'tua da, okay, so a p'tua daka can't marry Bikalasha. So my husband told me he was involved in a case where there was a woman who was a gioret, a convert. Now, a convert generally can't marry a Kohen. So there was a, there was a person who was a Kohen who was sick with cancer, had undergone chemotherapy, and could no longer have children. So the one of the Dayanim wanted to suggest to allow them to get married that maybe we could call this person a p'tua daka. Right, because again, what exactly the definition is? Right, part of it is that they can't have children. So he said, "Let's call this person a p'tua daka, and then he'll be allowed to marry the gioret, because then he will be in the category of people who are not bikal Hashem, which then can marry a gioret, and that would resolve the kohen gioret problem." Right. In other words, whenever a case comes up of a kohen wants to marry a gioret, so the beit didn't at least depending on who the beit is, but they try to see is there some way to figure out a solution. So he suggested the solution, which sounded like a perfect solution. What happened? The other Dianim firmly disagreed with him and why you can probably think about it on your own, which is they said this sets a precedent. If we call this person a Ptsua Daka, then any time, right, another Kohen comes to get married and he's not, right, he's not going to marry a Giyorid, he's going to marry a regular woman, well, we're going to have to disqualify him because he's a Ptsua Daka and he can't marry, right, he'll be like a mom's there on the, on the blacklist. We don't want to add that to the list. So the, the Dayan, who had said it was okay, said, we'll deal with those problems when we get there. In other words, he said, this is where we have creativity in halacha, right? We can, for this person, we'll call him a p'tzua daka. When the next case comes up, we won't call it a p'tzua daka. It's like an interesting debate within halacha, right? The other rabbi said, no, once you call someone who underwent chemotherapy and can't have children anymore, p'tzua daka, you're going to have to do that to every kohen who comes along, right? Any, 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 not even kohen, anyone who comes along. It's a very interesting debate. Unfortunately, they didn't rule like the Dayan. They overruled him, and they wouldn't allow the couple to get married. I don't know what happened in the end, but but um, he his ruling was not accepted. So, but it's an interesting application of what we're learning. So let's go back to our Gemara, though. So we tried to compare these two cases. The question is, are they comparable? So now we're going to say the same thing that we said a minute ago about the comparison that Rabbi Meir made to a Yisrael. We're going to say the same thing here. 
Mi mai? Why are you thinking these are similar? Dilma ad kan lo ka'an mrei Rabbi Elazar ve Rabbi Shimon ha'atam, ela di yesh lo lahachil v'makom achil. The regular Kohen could have married a regular woman, not someone who was divorced, and they could have allowed her to eat truma. In other words, they have the power to bring truma to other people, right? That's why the Rabbi Lazar and Rabbi Shimon said we're not disqualifying her, because the Kohen himself has the, has the power to do that. But Ptsua Daka, Valhacha, De'en lo lachil v'makom achil lo. Ptsua Daka can't bring another woman into eat truma. Now, you have to understand a few things about Ptsua Daka. Certain things we don't really know, and there's going to be a question about this right now. Ptsua Daka is a Kohen. Now, it's true he can't marry within the community, but right, he can't marry Bekal Hashem, so he can marry a mom's heir, he can marry a convert, he can marry people who are considered not necessarily, right, the, or, right, a Gioret is, can go both ways, right? The convert can marry within and can also marry without. A mom's heir can only marry without, right? Ptsua Daka also. So now, um, a Ptsua Daka can eat truma. Okay, if he's a Kohen, he's not disqualified from eating truma. He can't do the avoda in the temple. He can't do certain things, but he can eat truma. Okay, in certain ways, he is still a Kohen. And that's what's going to cause some confusion in today's stuff. So they say, but but he can't marry a woman because he's not allowed to marry. So he can't marry a woman and bring her into truma. So he's not comparable to the Kohen in our Mishnah, who, while he can't marry the Grusha, he can't the divorcee or the Chalutza, but he can marry other women. So you can't compare. So now they say, what do you mean? What about the daughter of a convert? Now we're going to learn today, there's a three-way machloket about a daughter of a convert. What's her status? And can she marry a coin? A convert cannot marry a coin, but maybe the daughter of a convert can marry a coin. So maybe you could say a daughter of a convert. Now, again, we're going to see this is a bit of a debate. Is she Bikal Hashem or not necessarily Bikal Hashem? Is she more like a Gioret who can marry in or out? So if you say she can marry out, meaning she could marry a Ptsua Daka, then if he marries her and she's a, he's allowed to marry her because he's not a Kohen, really. He's a Kohen, but right. the, the question is, there's actually going to be a debate about this. Does, does the Ptsule Kihuna apply to him? Right On the one hand, he can't marry within the community, but the question is, can he marry a, uh, a divorcee that's out, the, out of the community or a convert? It's a bit of a question. So theoretically what they're saying is maybe he can't marry a convert but the daughter of a convert maybe he can marry and then he could bring her because she's sort of not Bikal Hashem she's not Psula the Kiwana because she's the daughter of a convert again it sort of depends what you hold about her we'll get to this later more in detail right now we're not going to understand it too well but later in the daf they're going to go back to this and explain it much better so maybe you could say if he married the daughter of converts he theoretically could have her eat truma in which case we have a case but, we don't know for sure whether he can or not. It happens to be a question. Rabbi Yochanan asked Rabbi Yoshaya, which we're going to see later. And Rabbi Yoshaya didn't know the answer. So we don't really know if he has the power to feed, to allow, if he were to marry the daughter of converts, could she end up eating truma? We don't know. So because we don't know that, we can't say that he does for sure have the, the uh, option. So again, what did we do so far? We tried to compare the case of a Ptsua Daka marrying right, anyone theoretically, right, about Israel or maybe about Kohen. Would that be the exact same machloket? Because again, they're Mishta Merit Libya Psula. They're waiting. It's all it's only Kiddushin. They're now in waiting to end up doing some forbidden relationship. Is <clears throat> right, it does he mess her up for Truma or not? Can we compare the cases? Right now we say no, we can't, because Cohen has the capability of bringing someone into the world of Truma, and the Ptua Daka does it. Maybe he does by a Bakirim, we don't really know though. So we can't say that. But now we're going to have a Machlok at Abai and Rava, but both of them are going to reject the rejection and basically say, Ptua Daka can be compared to our Mishnah. And then we can say it's the same exact Machlok at. Why? Because he can feed someone Truma. He does have the capability to bring Truma to someone. So let's see the two options. Itmar, and then we'll get into why each one didn't agree with the other. Okay, this is a case where a man is not yet a Ptsua Daka. He marries a woman. He allows her, he's a Kohen. He allows her to eat Truma. Then he becomes a Ptsua Daka. At this point, they're not supposed to remain married, but in the event that they remain married and below Yida'a, and they don't engage in relations, because really it's forbidden for them to have relations, they don't engage in relations. That's below Yida'a, right? Yida'a, like the Torah word. Um, so now they say, since 
she, right, so now this is a case where he remains married to her and she continues to eat truma, right? If she were to have relations with him while he's a p'tzua daka, she can't eat truma anymore. But she's below yida'a, they're not having relations. So therefore, here's a case where p'tzua daka can enable a woman to eat truma, right? As long as he stays married to her, she can keep eating truma. So there you have a case where he could theoretically, there is a theoretical case where he could have a woman eating truma, and therefore we could say it's comparable to the Mishnah. Rava Amal, Ho'ilu Machila, Babada Vishiphotava Knanim. Do you remember that we said that um, the household eats truma? Everyone in the household, including, right, when you have a Kohen. So the Ptuadaka, we already said, can definitely eat truma. So any of his slaves can eat truma as well because of him. So what do you see here? He has the capability to pass on the, the ability to eat truma to other people. Now, we're talking about slaves, different category, but it's still potentially he could bring. So therefore, we would we would say it's the same as our mission. So Abai, Lo Amar Kirava, this is pretty easy. Abai is going to say, I don't agree with you, Rava, because you probably would have said this yourself. You're comparing slaves to marriage, right? We want to find that he can enable someone through a marriage relationship to eat truma. That's what we're looking for in our comparison, not for someone who can enable slaves to eat. That's a different type of relationship, right? So therefore, you can't talk about the the acquiring of a slave and his ability to pass on truma there to the acquiring of a woman. This, by the way, is going to be helpful when we get to Kiddushin, and, and I know, right, we're, there's some things on today's stuff that you're going to get people upset, and you get upset when you start with Kiddushin, and you say, Ha'ishan yikne, the woman is acquired by a man in Kiddushin in three ways, and then it says, Ha'evin yikne, and then Ha'beheman yikne, and, you know, she seems to be in this category of acquiring slaves, acquiring animals, but clearly they're saying, that's not the same kind of kinyan. Yes, it's true, we're calling it a kinyan, but it's not the same type of thing, right? You can't compare, you can't learn from one to the other, so that's why Baya says, I, I wouldn't learn it from there. That's a very different type of kinyan. Okay, even though technically it might be done in a similar manner, it's not the same thing. But Rava lo amar kabai. Why wouldn't Rava say like kabai? It's a much better explanation that there is some way he can allow his wife to continue eating truma. Well, the key is the word to continue eating truma, right? It's different. She already was eating truma in a way that was permitted, right? So. Um, Abaye says shakfar a. Uh, uh, Sorry, says she was already eating because the marriage was done in a way that he was a perfectly good Kohen. Only later did he become a Ptsua Daka. This reminded me, by the way, someone asked a question. I wanted to relate to it in class about the Cheresh. Okay, because sometimes I don't explain everything because we've explained it other times and then I forget that some people, you know, might have just started learning with us now. But the Cheresh in yesterday's stuff we talked about was a deaf mute and the question is why are they considered a person without that? That was all discussion in the beginning of Chagiga, if you remember, in Chagiga, those who learned Chagiga, those who didn't, we had a whole discussion about it, about these categories of people that the rabbis considered without dot. We talked about whether things would be different today because of modern technology and ways that people can be functional within the community in a very different manner, right? We just have to accept that in those days, they view those people as not part of the community, right? And even, right, in modern day times, people still view some people like that outside the community. They shouldn't anymore. But certainly if you look back 50 years or 100 years, for sure, they were considered not part of the mainstream community, right? Things are much different nowadays, and I think we'd have to revisit, right? And people do. People are writing articles about revisiting these categorizations, okay? So we just have to accept that that's how they viewed it then. And again, they talked in Chagiga. What I always liked about it was a story about people who were deaf, and then it turns out they really knew everything when they, when they were able to, I think they couldn't speak, and then they managed to speak, and then they realized they knew a lot. So it's not so clear-cut. Um, but there are general categorizations of people, and they're in the category of people who don't have dot. Okay, so why did I think of this? Because this is a similar thing where there, the, the marriage was done when he was, before he became a deaf mute, and then later, when he became a deaf mute, right, that, that the things changed. So here, the same thing. This is just a continuation. It's not a place where he was able to allow her when he was a Ptua Daka. No, he's just able to continue what was. That's not the same. He says, I don't buy it that it's just a continuation because there's no such thing as a continuation when it comes to truma. I'll show you why. If you think every time a woman can eat truma, she just forever continues, like you're kind of saying, right? There's no new thing going on here once it became a tzua daka that allows her to continue to eat truma because whenever she starts, she's allowed. That's not true. A woman who marries uh, uh, Yisrael, 
by Israel. She's the daughter of Israel. She can't eat truma when she grows up. She marries a Kohen, and then the Kohen dies. We talked about this already, right? She can't eat truma anymore unless she has children, right? Then it's something different. But assuming she doesn't have children, she can't eat truma anymore once he dies. So what do you see? Kfar achla, once you, if you say she was already permitted, that wouldn't, that wouldn't work here, right? It doesn't work for truma. We don't say such a thing. So what does Rava say to that? He says, no, no, no. You're comparing two different things. A woman whose husband died, Rava says, they're no longer connected because he died. But here she was married to the Ptsua Daka, right? And then Hacha lo paka kinyane. Here the, the Kinyan didn't disappear, right? She's still connected to him. That's why she continues to eat. Because once connected to a man, as long as you're still connected to him, even if he's now in a different state of Ptsua Daka, that if he had started that way, he wouldn't have allowed you to eat Truma. The fact, right? You can still continue. It's just a continuation because they just remain married. So she just continues her current status. Only when they die or divorce, then she goes back to her original thing. And you, you don't use this shekenacha. And that's why Rava didn't want to use this as an answer because he says it's just a continuation. It's just continuing on. It's not like his power as a p'tzua daka can allow her to eat truma. It can't. Okay? And that's why he doesn't accept Abai. Either which way you look at it, though, Rav and Abai each brought, even though we brought questions on each one, each of them brought an explanation for why, in the end, how we can compare P'tzua to Kata, our Mishnah, and then say that the Machloket in the Mishnah, about whether Kiddushin, with a forbidden re- relationship, right, a Kohen Gadol, uh, and, a, and a widow, or a Kohen and a Grusha, whether Erusin is enough to disqualify her from eating Truma, would be the same Machloket by P'tzua Daka and Again, fill it in by your commentary, either by Israel or by Kohen, whether you can enable her to eat truma or whether you can disqualify her from eating truma. Okay, that's the, does the Ptsua Daka have the power to disqualify truma eating by this woman by Kiddushin alone? Again, okay. both of them are where you're waiting for a Biapsula, meaning your next stage is going to be in a forbidden relationship. Okay, Gufa. Now we're going to go back to this question that Rabbi Yochanan asked Rabbi Yoshai, and Rabbi Yoshai didn't have an answer. First, we're going to see the story end of it, like how the whole question and answer transpired or lack of answer. We're going to see like a bit of an interesting story. Then we're going to get into the details of the question and according to which opinion was it said. And we're going to see that there's three different opinions about the daughter of converts. It's a very interesting machloket and her status in terms of Kohanim and the status of a Ptsua Daka, who's a Kohen, all sorts of interesting things. So Gufa. So now we're going to go back into this question. That we're just quoting what we saw before. Rabbi Yochanan asked Rabbi Yoshaya, Ptsua daka kohen shenasa bat gerim, maos yochlen abetruma. Ptsua daka who marries the daughter of converts, is he allowed, does he enable her to eat truma? So, again, this is through marriage. Ishtik velo, amrele velo miti. He was silent and he didn't say a word. Next thing that happens, lesof, after that, Atagavar Rabba Achrina, a different prominent rabbi comes in. Remember, the Yochanan was a very prominent rabbi. Next in walks another prominent rabbi, which we'll see in a minute who it was. Ubamine Milta Achrita. And he asks a different question. We don't know what it is. Upashale, and he answers him. So we have this scene. Rabbi Yochanan comes into Rabbi Yoshaya, and Rabbi Yoshaya ignores him. Next rabbi comes into Rabbi Yoshaya, and Rabbi Yoshaya answers him. So, Ma, and Manu, just as a side, who was that big rabbi who came in after? Who do you think of when you think of Rabbi Yochanan? Rish Lakish. So it was Rish Lakish. Comes in Rabbi Yehuda Nesia. Okay, you might remember in one of my favorite stories is in uh, in Megillah, where we have the funny sendings of the Mishlochem Anot. So one of the famous stories is between Rabbi Yehuda Nesia and Rabbi Yoshaya. Okay, so... Um, uh, and it's where he says, what? What did you send me? You sent me this. And there were actually all sorts of different versions of the story. But you see, they had a relationship. Rabbi Yehuda Nesia is the grandson of Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi. So I'm really Rabbi Yehuda Nesia, the Rabbi Yoshaya. He says to him, I don't get it. Aren't you Rabbi Yochanan Lavka for Rabbi? Who, what? Is Rabbi Yochanan not a great prominent rabbi? What? He comes in, you don't answer his questions. Only Rish Lakish comes in. I don't get it. So I'm really to Kaban Mine Milta, Delay Le Patra. He asked me a question I didn't have an answer for. That's why I didn't answer him. Don't think it was that I didn't afford him the respect he deserved. I just didn't know the answer. Now, it's an interesting story because obviously Rabbi Yoshaya did do something wrong. He should have said, 
I don't know the answer, right? He should have responded to him in some way and explained, right? It's always frustrating. You know, sometimes you talk to people and they just ignore you and you don't, you know, they ignore you because they don't have an answer. They ignore you. It's never good to ignore people, right? It, and it, it, it looks bad because here, well, look what happened. The contrast, it made Rabbi Yochanan embarrassed. In any case, that's the story part. Now we get to the question. Liman, according to, is this question asked? Now we're going to, it's going to unfold and as it would have been nice had they just quoted us the three opinions from the beginning. But instead, they're going to go into each opinion and then through a discussion about the opinion, then they'll finally get to what that person holds. So it's a little kind of backwards, but we'll read it and explain. Ela Rabbi Yehuda. Now, if we hold like Rabbi Yehuda, who holds something about the bat of the daughter of converts, which we're going to see through a machloket, the question is, there's still two options within each of them. There's two options about the track of a psua daka. Is a psua daka, who's a kohen, is he still, remember, we said he could eat truma. He's at this in-between. He's not exactly, though, he can't marry within the community. But are the isurim of a kohen still upon him? Like, for example, can he not um, marry? And that's the isurim about marriage. His issues seem to be relating only to marriage. Like, for example, he can't, become impure to dead people like Kohanim. He, right, he, he can eat truma. He's got certain things about Kohanim. But when it comes to marriage, since we put him outside the community, he can't marry normally, are the forbidden relative, are the forbidden um, women like a divorcee also forbidden to him or not? Okay? So that depends on whether you say he's bikdushate, he's sanctified like a regular Kohanim, meaning he can't marry someone who's divorced, or you say he's not bikdushate and he can marry a divorcee. Or, for example, a convert, okay? So, there's two tracks. So, if you hold a Rabbi Yehuda, which we don't yet know what he holds about converts, we're going to have to get to it soon, the daughter of converts. We're now going to say there's clearly no question to Rabbi Yehuda. Rabbi Yehuda will for sure say there's no way his wife can eat truma. Why? We're going to do the two tracks. If he's like a regular Kohen and can't marry uh, a convert, then... Lo achla. He, she def, so if he can't marry a convert, he can't marry the daughter of a convert either. Why? Because Rabbi Yehuda holds. Now we're going to finally get to his opinion. Daha Amar Mar, which is, means Rabbi Yehuda says, Bat ger zachal kebat chalal zachar. The daughter of a male convert is like the daughter of a chalal, meaning she can't marry a kohen. Okay? What does it mean, the daughter of a chalal? How does halalut work? Halal, halal is someone who was born from a divorcee and a kohen, let's say, a forbidden relationship of kahuna. So a divorcee marries a kohen, they have a child. If it's a daughter, she can't marry a kohen. She's a halala. If it's a son, then it gets passed down one more generation. His daughter is a halala and can't marry a kohen either. Okay? So if, basically, if she's like the daughter of a halal, Zahar, we're going to compare. Since the daughter of a, of a man born to a forbidden relationship is forbidden, the daughter of that union is forbidden to marry a coin, we're going to call the second generation convert also forbidden to marry a coin if her father converted. So therefore, she was the daughter of Gerim, which means her father was a convert. So she couldn't marry him, which means, right, he's Vikdu Shate, so he has all the Isurim of a coin upon him, and he married someone who's forbidden to him, so no, she, de she definitely can't eat Truma. And and if you say, now we're going to see another opinion of Rabbi Yehuda, if you say that he's not Bikdushate, and he can marry any divorcee, convert, it doesn't matter. But remember, he's not Bikdushate. Now, a Ptsuotak can only marry someone who's not Bikal Hashem. Well, Daha Amrinan Kahal Gerim Ikre Kahal. A Kahal is a, a convert, community is, yes, Bikal Hashem which means that they can't, a convert can't marry a Ptsua Daka ever. So if, again, it's going to be a forbidden relationship. Either way you look at it, according to Rabbi Yehuda, it's a forbidden relationship. Because we're going to see there's two questions. Number one, is she forbidden to marry a, this Ptsua Daka Kohen, right? Is, in other words, is, um, is she considered someone who can't marry Kohanim? And is she considered part of the community? If she's considered part of the community, she can't marry a Ptsua Daka no matter what. So basically, according to Rabbi Yehuda, there's no way it's a permitted relationship on either track, and therefore there's no question. Obviously, she can't eat truma because as soon as it's a forbidden relationship, she can't eat truma. Either Rabbi Yossi, second opinion, bein bikdushatekai, bein la bikdushatekai. Again, take both of, one of each of these tracks. Either which way, um, achla, she can eat. Why? Because he has a different approach about each of these things. 
Why? If we go the track that he's sanctified, meaning he can't marry anyone who's forbidden. Well, we're going to see he doesn't think second generation convert is forbidden. To Ha'amar. Af Gersh and Asa Giorit, even if both parents are converts. Bitok Sheral the Kuna, the daughter can marry a Kohen without a problem at all. So therefore, it's a great marriage, right? It's fine. Okay, now it's fine because right, he can't marry a convert, but she's not a convert, so he can marry her, and therefore she can eat. If we say he's on the other track, he's not forbidden to marry her. Well, Dahamar, Kahal Girim, Lo Ikre Kahal. Now, even though he permits this second generation convert to marry a Kohen, he also, it's actually interesting how these two work together. It's a good question. He says the Kahal of Gerim, a convert, right, and one who comes from two parents who are converts, are not considered Bekal Hashem, which means she can, right, it means they're they're kind of considered, they're actually both. They can marry within the community, just right, and they can marry even without of the community. They kind of fall into every community. So, in which case, it's a permitted marriage even if he's, right, even if he's not big dushate, it's still a permitted marriage. So no matter what, she can eat truma. So therefore, the question that Rabbi Yoshai couldn't answer couldn't have been according to either one of these two opinions, because it would be obvious what the answer is. So therefore, El Aliba Dahaitan, it must be according to this opinion. Ditnan. Rabbi Lezer ben Yaakov Omer, Isha bat gerim, lo tinase lekuna ajate imam Yisrael. She's the daughter of gerim, this is the opposite of Rabbi Yehuda. If her mother is Jewish by birth, and her father is Jewish by conversion, then she's allowed to marry a Kohen. But if her mother was a convert, then she can't marry a Kohen. So now, Haki Kamebayali, this was his question. Do we say if her mother is Jewish from birth, Kashrut mitos v'achla, Odilma kedusha mitos v'lo achla, what does it help you that your mother was Jewish from birth if your father's a convert? Does it add on Kashrut? It means you're just permitted to marry the Kohen, but you're not necessarily considered Bikal Hashem. Or is it Kedusha Mitos Vabat? You're considered part of Kal Hashem if, as long as your mother is Jewish from birth, and therefore, Lo Achla, you can't marry the Ptsu Adaka. So, the, right, this, because again, there's two issues here. There's, can you marry a Kohen? And are you considered part of Kal Hashem? If you can marry a Kohen, but you're not considered part of Kal Hashem, then great, go marry this Ptsu Adaka Kohen. It's perfect, right? And then you can eat Truma. But if we say no, you're kosher to marry a coin, but you're, um, right, kedushami tosvaba, but you're part of Kal Hashem also, right? You're also kosher to kunan. You're also only part of Kal Hashem now. If your mother was Jewish from birth, then you can't marry a p'tzua daka. And then you won't be able to eat truma from this marriage. So that was his question. Okay? And that's why he didn't know the answer. Tashma, now they say, by the way, even though Rabbi Yashai didn't have an answer, we, have, we found an answer. When he came from the south, he brought a brayta with him that said the following thing. How do you know that she can eat truma? He learns it from a pasuk. If he purchases someone, again, acquiring, it's not exactly a purchase for a woman. We talked about that earlier today, but that's how they call it. It's a he, she becomes his. Kinyan kaspo, right? He, she becomes part of his household. And then who yochabu. That person can eat. So now we learn from here because it says nefesh. Nefesh seems to be a word that includes kind of everyone. It's going to include an extra person, which is even the daughter of converts. Now we have a special drasha to teach that, yes, she can eat truma. Now the question is, how do we know this answers the question? Because we said there was Rabbi Yehuda who definitely said no. There was Rabbi Yossi who definitely said yes. And then there's Rabbi Lezer ben Yaakov who we weren't sure. So what we have to prove is that this bright is according to Rabbi Lezer ben Yaakov. Bright definitely can't be Rabbi Yehuda, but maybe it's Rabbi Yossi who said she can eat. And then this wouldn't prove anything about his question because his question was asked according to Rabbi Lezer ben Yaakov's opinion. So the Gemara says, Laman, according to who is this Drasha said about? In Lamele Rabbi Yehuda, of course not, because Hamar ben Bikdusha tekai ben Labik Dusha tekai lo achlan, no matter what she can eat true. Ve'ila Rabbi Yossi, Lamalika, he wouldn't need a verse to prove it. It's obvious because, again, it's based on all his other opinions. No matter what you can eat, you wouldn't need a drasha to say it. And therefore, we just proved. What do you see here? It seems clear. She can eat truma. So here you have it. There's your answer to the question. Because if it was only kashrut, kshirut lekeuna, that's what allows her to marry the p'tzua daka, because she's still considered not necessarily part of Kalashem, which means she could even marry him, 
even right because he's on the outs. She can still marry him, but yet she's permitted, right? He's Bikdusha Teka. She's permitted to marry the Kohen, and therefore she gets the rights to eat Truma. Shema Mina. So we proved that it was Rabbi Lezer ben Yaakov, and we proved that you can eat, and there's an answer to the question that Rabbi Yoshaya didn't have an answer to, and neither did Rabbi Yochanan. Okay, now we're going to get into a different machloket, which is similar to the Mishnah. In the Mishnah, we talked about Kiddushin, right? Remember, there's we generally talk about two stages of marriages, Kiddushin, Nisuin. There's the engagement part, the betrothal, and then there's the marriage. But there's really something in between, which is chuppah. Okay, what is chuppah? Okay, first of all, if your Hebrew is good, you can listen to Daphne Shalai, and they have a whole thing about different opinions about chuppah and all that. We'll mention some of them. It's unclear what exactly chuppah is, but chuppah is basically preparation for the real act that consummates the marriage, which is having intercourse, which you obviously don't do at the wedding, right? But you do something at the chuppah that's symbolized. And there's a different opinions about what exactly, well, when you think of a chuppah, you think of the chuppah that goes on top of them. So one opinion is the chuppah, according to halacha, is going under a canopy. Okay? Some people think chuppah is going into the room. Some people say it's the bedeckin. Some people, it's some sort of thing that connects the couple that shows that they can be together, sort of, okay? Like some sort of action that symbolizes that they will ultimately be having relations and consummating the marriage. But it's not, they're not, they are fully married, but it's kind of still missing one last stage. So the question is, now, according to Rashi, we're talking about a case where they skipped the stage of Kiddushin. Okay, they didn't do Kiddushin. And now we want to know, is Chuppah, if you do Chuppah, same as our Mishnah, a Kohen and a Grusha, let's say, a divorcee and a Kohen, does Chuppah, they didn't do Kiddushin, because otherwise we'd have the Machlok out already from before. Because that was if they did Kiddushin. They skipped Kiddushin and they just did Chuppah, but they didn't yet have relations. So again, the Isur is the having relations. They didn't yet do that. So Rav Amar, yesh chupa lipsulam. He says, chupa invalidates her at this point from eating truma, right? Let's say she was a Bak Kohen. She can no longer eat truma, okay? Or if she's a Yisrael, right? When she eventually ends up married, right? She will not be able to eat truma. So anyway, he basically, we're now going to say, um, so the chupa itself is enough to disqualify her. Shmuel Amar, Eng There is no chuppah for psulot, meaning chuppah is not enough to disqualify her yet. Not until they have relations. Until they have relations, that's when she becomes disqualified for eating truma. So Amr Shmuel, we're going to have an aside here. Take a deep breath. <laughs> this is something that comes up a lot in the Gemara, and it always, right from a kind of, I would say, an outsider's perspective, it's always very disturbing. Okay, what we're talking about is a, a child, a woman or a girl, or a baby, right? A little kid who's three and a day, according to halacha, is already considered potential for having sexual relations, okay? Why this is, I don't have an answer, okay? The rabbis came up with terms, okay? With definitions. A man, it's at the age of nine in a day. With a woman, it's at the age of three in a day. Um, maybe they did it, again, we can come up with reasons why, we don't really know. Maybe they did it to discourage men from, abusing young girls. And it was a way of saying, your bi is bi and you know, this. The, the whole thing is, what is considered the act of intercourse? Is it an act of intercourse if the woman is too young, right? So the question is, what is too young? And maybe it's a way of discouraging men from taking advantage of young girls. It's possible to see it that way. Um, the way I deal with understanding, with not getting upset about this and saying, what are they talking about? Again, the under, just like, most of our Masechet, is very theoretical cases. This is an, an legalistic discussion. These are legal discussions at what age? It doesn't mean that they were having relations with women at that age, and it doesn't mean that they were saying, go betroth a woman as soon as she's three in a day, or go do yibum with a woman. No, they're not saying that. What they're saying is, if this were to happen, this is the this is the cutoff point, right? This is where we consider her ruyalabia. She could theoretically, and this is where we say she couldn't theoretically. And then there's all sorts of ramifications, which we're going to see in a minute. But I don't think that it's worth getting worked up about it because, again, I've, I've seen things. For example, there was a rabbi who was giving a shear about this topic because it's a topic in the Gemara. And then people went crazy. How could these rabbis be talking about these things? And it's, it's you know, misogynist. And, but it's not. It's in the Gemara and we're learning it. And it's, it's a legal discussion. It's not, it's not meant for anything more than that, really. Um, so... Anyway, with that, we'll learn this sugya, which is, Amr Shmuel, Umo deli Abba betinoke pchutami bat shalosh shanim v'yom echad, ho'il ve'en la bi'ah, en la chupa. Again, now we have to figure out, what is chupa? Chupa is, 
When Rav says, yesh kupa lepsulo, that means because kupa is the stage right before they're going to have relations, so the kupa is enough already at this stage to say she's disqualified from truma. Comes Shmuel and says, well, you'd agree with me, though, if the chupa was with a girl that was under three and wasn't potentially, couldn't have bia. Okay, again, he has to go back to this three because that's the age they defined it. And he's not really saying someone would do this, but he's saying if she's not ruya bia, then chupa is not relevant. Okay, right? It's not, it's not something that's going to disqualify her from eating truma because there's no potential for bia because she's not ruya bia. Even if he did somehow have relations with her, it wouldn't be considered relations. Okay, again, it's not like they're saying someone would have relations with her. They're just saying if that were to have happened, it wouldn't be anything. So now, I'm a Rav, Af Ananami Tanina. I'm going to prove what Shmuel just said. And here we're going to get into all sorts of halachot that have to do with this cutoff age, because it all has to do with all sorts of different things that are forbidden for um, for a woman who is potentially of age to be able to have relations. So, Bat Shalosh Shanim B'Yom Echad, Mitkadeshet Bibia. This isn't saying, go do this. This is just saying, if a man would betroth the woman through intercourse, and she was anywhere over the age of three, that would be considered Kiddushin. If it was under the age of three, it wouldn't even be considered Kiddushin. Again, don't try to imagine this because they're not, they're just, this is a legal discussion to kind of put out there, right, what's the what's considered when we say Kiddushin Bibia, what does Bia mean, right? At what age is Shiru Yala Bia? In Ba'ala, and there's the real question is why they determined it was the age of three, and I don't know the answer to that question. Again, the only thing I can think about is maybe it was a way to protect these women from uh, but I don't know. Uh, so that's number one. Number two, if a yabam says it, it would have relations with her, so that would acquire her, even if she's only four, right? Again, not recommending it, but it would theoretically have worked. Right, He would have to be over, right? There's a whole discussion about what age he has to be anyway. I think we are, I don't believe we've seen that yet. We're going to get to it. Um, if she was betrothed to someone, let's say, right, that you could imagine. Parents arranged a marriage when the kids were young, right? And then some man has relations with her. This is where I would say this protects her, right? If she'd had Kiddushin, then basically she's an Eshadish. If someone were to do something to her, and he'd be, right, that would be pretty serious. Uh, her husband, if, or... And anyone who has relations with her, if she's in Nida, again, this wouldn't be likely someone three years old, this is where you could clearly prove that she's not, this isn't realistic, this is theoretical because nobody has a period at age three. If she was in Nida and someone has relations with her, then he takes on the status of her in terms of Tuma. He becomes impure for seven days. There's one minor difference. I'll try to say it very sh- quickly. She is metame mishkav. That means anything she sits on becomes not only tame, but an avatuma, high level tuma. It's a special unique law by Azav and Anita. We've seen this in different times before. But he takes on the same level of tuma, but with one minor difference. If he sits on something, right, he's tame for seven days like she is. But if he sits on something or lies on something, it will only be like elyon, like something he carries. Something he carries, he can only turn into a rishon not an avatuma, which is the next level down. So also something he sits on, that's what it means, metami mishkav tachton, something under him is like an elyon, is like something he carries, meaning it's only rishon, not an av. Okay, these are just all different ramifications. Nisei le kohen ochelep etruma, if she marries a kohen, again, once she's of that age, she can already eat truma. Ba'ale acha mikola psulin, psala. Anyone who's pasul, let's say she's divorced already at that age. Again, that's why it's purely theoretical. She's divorced already at that age. Well, then, and then she's with a Kohen, so that would disqualify her. But shalosh shani v'yom. Now, what's the inference that Rabbi makes to try to prove what Shmuel just said? But shalosh shani v'yom achad, who do me pasul b'biya, me pasul b'chopa. Right? Ha pchutami, but shalosh shani v'yom achad, lo me pasul b'biya, lo me pasul b'chopa. Right? She ba'aleha, she's psula by having relations with him only if she's over three. If she's under three, no. So that would be the same then for chupa. If bia wouldn't disqualify her, then obviously chupa wouldn't disqualify her. And last line for today. Third opinion about this. We had yesh chupa b'psulot according to Rav. We had Shmuel who said en chupa b'psulot. Now we have Rami Barchama who says yesh chupa b'psulot. That topic, is there chupa, is there not chupa? Banu lemachloket Rabbi Meir v'Rabbi Lazar v'Rabbi Shimon. It's exactly the same as the previous. Remember, someone who does kiddushin to one of these women that's forbidden, 
since she's mishtameret libiapsula, her next stage is to do biapsula, right? Even though we now learned there was a stage in between, which was chupa, but chupa to bia is like kiddushin to bia, right? In other words, it's a pre, it's before, and therefore it's going to be the exact same machlok. Tomorrow we're going to try to reject this and say not necessarily, and we'll read exactly why they say, you know, what they say, and then we'll we'll get more into this uh, issue tomorrow. With that, we'll finish our shiur for today. Have a great day, everyone.